All right, I guess I'm on, right, Cindy? Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I, I think I'm at the very beginning of the quarter, students anyway. I'm Rich Kravitz. I'm the director at UC Center Sacramento. I uh, want to welcome everybody to this, um, this presentation and, um, and just say how proud we are of our students for having come this far. And um, some of you uh, in preparing your projects have done things that you've never done before. And we're really excited to hear about your work. And also just to say thank you so very much to our internship hosts who um, who make this all possible, make the experiential learning component of UC Center Sacramento, which is so critical, um, possible. Some of you quarter after quarter after quarter. So thank you very much. And um, I think uh, we've got a lot to do. So let's get started. All right, fantastic. And so, um, thank, so thank you again for everyone who is here in the audience. And so the format's gonna be that each student will present. Um, after the student presents, we will go ahead and take one question from their internship host site. If there is not a question from their internship host site, then we will go ahead and open up um, the question to our academic team. And so, um, so with that, I will call up our first student um, who is Haley Cavanaugh um, from UCLA and she interned with the Office of California State Governor Gavin Newsom's office. Haley. All right. Um, research showing the inequitable effects of suspensions have compelled many school districts in California to make policy changes. One policy, willful defiance, is a subjective type of punishment that removes students from the classroom for behavior only. I am researching if the removal of this category of punishment has had a significant impact at the high school level. My hypotheses are that school districts that banned willful defiance will have lower rates of overall suspension compared to districts that do not and that districts that ban willful defiance will have higher retention rates than districts that did not. To test these hypotheses, I compared high schools in Los Angeles School District to San Diego School District and San Francisco School District to San Jose School District. Los Angeles and San Francisco removed willful defiance while the others did not. To measure, I calculated how the overall percentage of suspensions changed yearly and compared it to the percentage of suspensions under the willful defiance category yearly for each district from 2012 to 2018. For my second hypothesis, I calculated the yearly retention rate and compared it to the yearly suspension rate. I found that schools that banned willful defiance had lower suspension rates both before and after implementing the policy change as seen in figures two and three. I also found strong correlation between decreasing willful defiance suspension and decreasing overall suspensions regardless of the willful defiance ban as seen in figure four. For my second hypothesis, I found no correlation between retention rates and willful defiance policy. My results lead me to recommend future researchers investigate why suspension rates fell and factors other than retention rate to determine the effectiveness of the policy on student outcome. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Haley. All right, so um, so a question from her internship host site. If, you, if anyone from the Office of the California State Governor, Gavin Newsom's office, office has a question, if you want, Go ahead and raise your hand. We will go ahead and call on you. All right, Emily Patterson. I unmuted on my end. You just need to unmute on yours. Perfect. Hi, thank you so much. Um, great job, Haley. Um, I had a question, um, which maybe is a bit broad for your project, but did you do any um, looking into what caused LA or San Francisco to implement a willful def defiance ban? Because um, I would also be curious if that had any influence on its own into your data. Yeah, so um, one of the things I found is that Los Angeles and San Francisco both have high populations of student of color, students of color, and um, willful defiance was found to have racial, um, be applied to students of color more than white students. So um, I think, or some people have hypothesized that Los Angeles and San Francisco both uh, implemented the change to try to um, kind of impact the racial disparities in suspension. Awesome, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so then our next student is Riley Williams. Um, home campus is UC Santa Barbara, and she interned with the Office of California State Governor Gavin Newsom's office. All right, going to share my screen. Okay. Good 
morning, everyone. California produces an abundance of agriculture, hosting over 750 certified farmers markets or CFMs statewide. However, the USDA estimates that 2.7 million Californians live in low income census tracts with limited access to fresh food options. So I propose the questions in terms of location, are certified farmers markets accessible for Californians of different income levels and racial or ethnic backgrounds? And I argue that cities and towns with lower median household incomes and in dollars will have fewer CFMs per 100,000 residents. And cities and towns with higher white populations as percents will have more CFMs per 100,000 people. To test my hypotheses, I ran two multivariate linear regressions using current data from 240 randomly selected cities and towns represented in figure one. First, I regress CFMs per 100,000 residents on median household income and next on the percentage of white residents. And my income hypothesis was not supported because the coefficient estimate is statistically significant from zero, but actually indicates that income and CFMs are slightly negatively associated, as figure two highlights. Still, with an estimated value of just negative 700 thousandths, the relationship is not very substantially significant. For my race hypothesis, however, the coefficient estimate is more substantive and suggests a positive relationship between CFMs and white populations that is statistically significant from zero. So my findings demonstrate preliminary support. The distribution of CFMs may not be racially equitable. So after further research, perhaps on the neighborhood level, policymakers may consider directing financial resources towards communities of color to create locally organized markets. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Riley. And so um, if there is a question from your her internship host site, if you can go ahead and just raise your hand um, then I can go ahead and call on you. Otherwise, we'll go to the academic team. All right, so a uh, question from the academic team. All right. Hi, Hi Riley. Hi. Hi, Riley. Great, great presentation. Uh, I was wondering what CFMs are and why they're important. Yeah, so certified farmers markets are basically a farmers market that has been certified with their county and with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. So it has to be operated by a certified producer a, or a local government or a nonprofit. So basically a farmers market that has that designation. And I think they are important for communities because they provide that direct to consumer fresh food option. And there have been uh, previous studies that show that implementing a certified farmer's market in a community that is facing um, a food insecurity or health disparities, they have uh, uh, consumers at those markets have reported increasing the amount of food and vegetables that they eat because these markets are more accessible to them. So I think they are helpful in reducing these um, food disparities and food insecurities, particularly in areas that have those insecurities like in food deserts or in low income, low access areas. Perfect, great, right. thanks so much. Thank you. thank you, and thank you, Riley. So our next student is Luke Zaketis. Uh, can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah, right. we can hear you, thank you. Um, so my paper was on uh, the user data industry, basically. So it's the collection of your user data to be sold to advertising agencies and AI research, um, as well as other things. And so the main enforcement body, uh, law for that in California is known as the CCPA. And so that gives users the right to know that their data has been collected and the right to opt out, as well as a few other areas. And so my question is basically, are companies uh, complying with that in different ways? on very varying on what kind of company it is. And so uh, my hypothesis is that larger companies will have more legal capabilities to kind of shirk the law and play into loopholes, make it more difficult for users to access their rights. So my dependent variables was that I studied 48 companies, measured the revenue, and uh, if there are members of the internet association. Um, and then my dependent variables were basically a scorecard system to measure if these companies were in compliance. Um, my research method was going through each of these company, companies' user interface and basically opting out of each one of them and then filling out a scorecard. And my results were that larger companies were worse in compliance by about 23 to 33% compared to smaller firms, and that internet association membership meant companies were often 
21% uh, worse on average. Uh, my policy recommendations based off of this research is that we need we need to standardize CCPA compliance practices and that way targeted ads need to provide receipts of where they got their data from. Great, thank you so much, Luke. And so, um, so is there a question from um, the audience in terms of this internship host site? If so, if you can just raise your hand, I'll go ahead and call on you. All right, and if not, we'll take one from the academic team. Um, Professor Butters, I see your hand up. Yeah, uh, hey Luke, uh, Professor Butters here for Paul 96 e uh, This is a great looking poster. I loved working with you on this the whole quarter. You've done a ton of work uh, and it's really impressive. Uh, one of the things that we had uh, discussed earlier, a little inside baseball here, I know that you've got some fun anecdotes about some of these companies. What was the worst company to get uh, your data from? Uh, it, it was definitely, um... So it's Yahoo, but what a lot of companies do is the parent company will take care of the CCPA. So you go through Yahoo and that takes you to Verizon, which as may can guess, they're not great compliance. Each click that you went through, through Verizon, they put timers so that it would take one minute to do each click through the process. And there was like 20 to 40 clicks I had to do. So it took literally at a minimum a half hour just sitting there watching your screen load, whereas the rest of the the pages were all high speed. So it's either that one or a company, a couple companies require passports or uh, driver's licenses to be scanned over, which is uh, kind of an invasion of privacy for a privacy law. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, th thank you. I know it's anecdotal evidence, but it's still, I thought really interesting and worth sharing. So great job, Luke, thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Luke, appreciate it. All right, so our next student is Bridget Mallon, whose home campus is UC Irvine and who interned with the um, District Office for California State Senator Tom Umberg. Bridget? Okay, everyone can hear me, right? Yes. All right, perfect. <laughs> Um, the majority of the United States and California rely on a plurality voting system, which has led to an unrepresentative government in which often elected officials have been selected by a small portion of the population, while the majority of the people's choices are dismissed. Multiple states have implemented some form of ranked choice voting to eliminate this issue, including several cities in California, as shown in figure one. My research question is, would ranked choice voting increase voter turnout in local elections and allow for more representative government? And I have hypothesized that its implementation would in fact lead to this increase. To prove this, I have collected data from two cities in California that have implemented ranked choice voting, San Francisco and Oakland, and compared them to two cities similar in demographics that have continued to use plurality voting, San Jose and Sacramento, as shown in figure two. By looking at the turnout in my dependent cities before and after the implementation of RCV and comparing to my constants, I have found that while ranked choice voting did not lead to an increase in overall voter turnout in general municipal elections as shown in figure three, it did lead to an increase in voter turnout when comparing it to the cases of runoff elections that often choose the final winners as shown in figure four. Through the analysis of voter data in the constant city of San Jose, it was shown that the disparity of voter turnout in general versus runoff elections have been as high as 58% less voters participating in the runoff as shown in figure five in the San Jose 2012 general and 2013 runoff election. In addition to RCV eliminating the need for runoff elections, it will also reduce the number of wasted votes and will lead to candidates who represent the majority rather than just the plurality. California should aim for its implementation in all local elections with the long-term goal of possible implementation in future state and congressional elections. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Bridget. And so if there um, was someone from the office who had a question, if you wanna go ahead and um, raise your hand and I will go ahead and call on you. All right, otherwise we'll go ahead and take a question from the academic team. All right, Paige. 
Hi, Bri, great project here. I would love to know if you think that the average American sort of has the enough information to be able to rank all of the candidates on the same ballot. Um, yes, so I have found through outside research that the majority of Americans do not are not informed about what ranked choice voting is. Um, I had done a quiz within my um, social media to see how many of my um, friends and family actually understood what ranked choice voting and um, there was only one out of 50 who, who knew about it. However, there were some um, opponents of RCV claim that um, ranked choice voting will be confusing for voters, um, that they won't understand what's going on, that they will only choose one because that is what they are familiar with. However, through positive campaigns, um, and sharing a lot of information, Maine, who has implemented um, ranked choice voting in their state and congressional elections, have found that that is not the case, um, that people, um, once they learn about it, are very um, competent and are able to do it without wasting those votes. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Bridget. All right, so our next student is Noah Aguirre, whose home campus is UC San Diego and who interned with the Office of California State Senator Scott Wiener. Okay, uh, oh, let me put this in full screen mode. Here we go. All right, so um, despite uh, California having the strongest economy of any state in 2020, we ranked just 37th in K through 12 public education. Uh, public schools are often funded by property taxes, uh, but California's 1978 law, Prop 13, keeps property taxes for the state relatively low, leading to the revenue of many school districts being subsidized by the state. In 2016, 58% of uh, school revenue was generated from the state, or, or from, yeah, from the state, as opposed to just 34% locally. So I hypothesize that California students or California school districts with a higher share of revenue generated locally uh, have a better or have on average better educational outcomes as school boards uh, that have more control of the allocation of money can use that money more efficiently. To test this hypothesis, I did a small comparative study of 12 California school districts in which I compared the percent of high school seniors in the district who met A through G college entrance requirements to the percentage of funding that district gets locally. Uh, I found a correlation between these two variables uh, at, at where in districts such as San Francisco Unified or San Diego Unified that had uh, very high local funding uh, that there were more seniors that met A through G requirements than in districts such as Elk Grove, which had a very low uh, percentage of local funding. Um, and, and had the majority of their funding come from the state. And this correlation also existed amongst black, white, and Asian students, but there were some major outliers with Hispanic students. So uh, based on these findings, I think some potential solutions could include abolishing or limiting Proposition 13 uh, in order to raise more revenue locally, building new housing uh, in order to raise more revenue locally, or giving school boards more control over the allocation of state-generated funds. All right, great, thanks, Noah. And so um, if there is a question from the audience, if you can go ahead from his office. All right, great. Um, Krista Pfefferkorn, I just unmuted you. Great, hi, Noah. Um, so you recommend abolishing Proposition 13, which was initiated by the voters. Do you know what that would take? Is it a, is it a vote of the people? Can the legislature do it? Great question, yes. So the only way Proposition 13 could be abolished or limited in any way would be through another uh, statewide ballot initiative, initiative, another proposition. The state legislator uh, really, they can, they can touch it on the, on the edges in some way, but they really can't do much uh, without a, uh, um, a direct ballot initiative, which is why I proposed a couple other solutions because that, uh, might be uh, fairly difficult to do. Yeah, okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Noah. And so our next student is Maria Meza-Quilar. 
Good morning. Are we ready to start? Yes, you can go ahead and share your screen, Maria. Shanisha Taylor, a job-seeking mother, was sentenced to 18 years supervised probation after being arrested for leaving her children in the car to attend a job interview. At the time of the arrest, Taylor stated to be jobless, homeless, and desperate. Because of her story, I have focused my research question on whether income inequality increases crimes. I hypothesize that as the income inequality gap increases over time, it will further push low-wage earners into absolute and relative poverty, ultimately causing low-wage earners to commit crimes for a higher benefit cost. In this research, I have conducted a time series study comparing crime rates and income distribution between all 58 counties in California from 2010 to 2019. Income inequality was measured by distributing household income in percentiles that range from the 10th to the 90th percent. Crime rates were measured by two categories, felonies and misdemeanors by 100,000 per capita. Based on my research, I have discovered that as income inequality increases, it has a small to no impact on crimes, except for the years of 2014, 2016, and 2017. As figure three demonstrates, in those years, income inequality did have a small impact on misdemeanors, but did not have an impact on felonies. As shown in figure four, my research also discovered that as percentages in poverty increase, rates in misdemeanors decrease, while rates in felonies decrease. Since poverty has a greater impact on crime than income inequality, I strongly recommend California to implement affordable educational programs, which can increase economic mobility. And lastly, I also recommend um, increasing minimum wage to help low wage earners a bit live above absolute and relative poverty. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Maria. And so Maria's home campus was UC San, or is UC San Diego, and she did um, intern with the Office of California State Assembly Member Wendy Carrillo's office. And so, if anyone from the office, oh, great, Jessica Zaragoza, went ahead and just unmuted you. Here we go. Hi, good morning, Maria. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, can you elaborate a little more, based on your research, where you found that the highest inequalities in California were? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Yes, um, can you, I'm curious to, to hear about where in your research you found that the higher inequalities in California were, where in the state? So when I first started my research, I had um, hypothesized that it was going to be um, Los Angeles County, but as I have more research, it's actually Oakland and San Francisco that has the highest disparity of income inequality um, among the Bay Area. Great, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Maria. So our, our next student is David Sutherland, whose home campus is UCLA, and who um, this term interned for, for the Office of California State Assembly Member, Kevin Kiley's office. Morning, everyone. As we enter the information age, new technology threatens to leave the modern life visible to anonymous observers. And at this time, it is crucial we ensure that our judiciary is protecting our privacy during the course of criminal investigations, which leads us to our crucial question. Do Republican appointed judges and Democratic appointed judges protect privacy equally? To operationalize this, I analyze whether there's a difference in the proportion of incriminating searches of electronic information authorized by, by Republican appointed judges or authorized by Democratic appointed judges. My initial hypothesis is that Republican appointed judges will have a lower proportion of incriminating intercepts than Democratic appointed judges. This is because Republican appointed judges have a higher tendency to be tougher on crime and consequently protect privacy less. This will lead them to authorize searches relatively less likely to find incrim incriminating evidence leading to a lower proportion of incriminating intercepts as they seek to stop as much crime as possible. I took all of the cases from 2019 involving an intercept of electronic information to determine the proportion of incriminating intercepts per judge, then average the proportions across Republican appointed judges and Democratic appointed judges to find an average proportion of incriminating intercepts per Republican appointed judges and Democratic appointed judges. Interestingly, as seen in figure two, I did not find a statistically significant difference between Republican appointed judges and Democratic appointed judges. However, the low overall average proportion of incriminating intercepts shown in figure, figures three and four emphasized that the Supreme Court needs to establish clear precedent regarding electronic privacy in order to increase average proportion of incriminating intercepts. Great, thank you, David. And so if there's a question from the audience from his office, we'll go, um, just go ahead and raise your hand and I will call on you. All right, and if not, a question from the academic team. All 
right, Professor Butters. Hey, David. Uh, Dr. Butters here from Paul 96 e uh, I think this is a great project. I know you did a ton of work on this one as well, uh, like everybody else that's been uh, here uh, in this presentation so far. Uh, I have been really interested in your methodology for how you've chosen your Republican appointed judges measures versus your Democratic appointed judge, judges measure. And I just wanted to know if you could tell us a little more about how you kind of the decision making process to kind of come down to uh, how you chose to make your, your independent variables. Sure. So I used a list of every single time an intercept was authorized in 2019 for electronic information. I combined that with a federal judiciary registry in order to determine whether the judge assigned to the case was appointed by a Republican or appointed by a Democrat. I then separated my case list into two judge groups, one for Democratic appointed judges, one for Republican appointed judges, and that ultimately became my independent variable. Fantastic, thank you. Great, thank you, David. And so our next student is Stephanie Batonzo. Um, Stephanie's home campus is UC Irvine, and this term she interned with the Office of California State Assembly Member, Sharon Quirk Silva. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, great. Thank you. Over the last decade, California has seen a 48% increase in student homelessness. Housing insecurity negatively affects a youth's development and academic performance, which is why I am interested in analyzing the relationship between homelessness students' educational outcomes and educational resources offered among the K-12 school system. I hypothesize that homeless students who go to schools with more educational resources have better educational outcomes compared to students that go to schools with less resources. To test my hypothesis, I use case studies from four different counties with similar population and demographic sizes and with the largest number of homeless students as identified by their school districts and analyze differences in the educational resources offered as seen in figure four. For successful educational outcomes, I looked at key indicators that influence student academic success, including suspension rates, chronic absenteeism rates, graduation rates, and UC CSU readiness rates as shown in figure three. I found that San Diego and Orange County had the greatest disparities in the percentage of students meeting UC CSU readiness rates. However, despite Orange County Unified School District appearing to have the most educational resources offered to their students and their families, it did not appear that the educational outcomes were significantly different compared to the other counties. Therefore, more research is needed to fully understand how educational resources impact state educational outcomes for students experiencing homelessness, which leads into my policy suggestions, which is compliance between school districts, city and county agencies to provide and coordinate access to these resources and ultimately support students and families experiencing homelessness, and also to ensure that these students are accessing the resources offered to them. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. And so um, if there was a question from her internship host office, um, oh, great. So Christopher Aguilar. Good morning, thank you very much. Stephanie, your project was very interesting to hear your explanation. Thank you so much for that. My question is in terms of Orange County, your research in Orange County, were you able to find any pockets of Orange County where there was greater, like where was there higher disparities in South County versus North Orange County? I ask because uh, or the Assemblywoman represents North Orange County and Orange County is a big county and there are differences with in the county from South County and, and, and North County. So anything you could provide would be great. Good job. Hi, Christopher, thank you for the question. I actually did kind of a generalization of each county. So I looked at specifically the school districts um, as overall to see the data that they have. So I wasn't able to specifically target um, specific regions in the county, but that does bring into an interesting question. And certainly more research on that can provide how we can support our students and see if one area is doing better than the other, how are they doing that? And how we can implement those changes to help support our students. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Stephanie. So um, then our next student is Stephanie Clavijo, uh, whose home campus is UC Davis. Um, and this term, she interned for the Office of California State Assembly Member, Cody Petrie Norris's office. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so we do not live in a meritocratic world. Our world is ruthless and unfair. A report by Ed Build showed that in the United States, POC school districts were receiving $23 billion less than their white counterparts. California has taken action to try and make school funding equitable by introducing LCFF. This leads us to our critical question. Is this funding formula reaching its goal? Is there funding discrimination based on the racial ethnic makeup of the district among um, a high poverty rate county such as Los Angeles? I theorize that the more white students in a school district, the more funding that district will receive. To answer this question, I looked at six low, medium and high population school districts within the LA County, pairing them up from one high POC and one high white majority school district in each group, while trying to control for similar levels of student needs. I looked at the LCFF funding for these schools from 2013 when the um, formula started uh, to 2019, which was the last year of available data. I compared the demographics of the school population in each school with their LCFF funding to see if there were any relationships. My finding does not support my hypothesis and have showed that LCFF funding has directed funds um, towards high POC school districts, but um, I have seen some flaws within the formula. Um, as you can see in figure two, Compton Unified receives less funding per student than El Monte, even though Compton has twice the population and almost three times the amount of high need students. And LCFF is supposed to direct funds to these specific students. Um, a possible reason for this is because El Monte had a higher consistent daily attendance of students while Compton did not. Um, because of this, I suggest for the funding formula to not be based off attendance as this seems to hurt students. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. And we, I see that we already have a hand up from your office. And so, Andrew Medina. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, this is Andrew. I'm a legislative director for Assemblywoman Cotty Petrino Arts and wanted to thank Stephanie for her service uh, in our office. Uh, she is so incredibly kind um, and so incredibly helpful. So um, happy to have you in the past couple months. Um, my question to the project is, I know you had mentioned attendance as uh, one of the changes that you would have for LCFF. Do you have other recommendations on how to improve LCFF? Um, for the local control funding formula that um, might even include like other pieces of, of what qualifies outside of poverty, um, um, foster care use and um, um, disability. Yeah, so um, LCFF does focus um, specifically on um, high need students, which uh, was defined as low income, um, foster youth and um, English learners. And I, um, I've uh, in the research, I saw that um, people suggest that instead of doing daily attendance, um, we focus on um, just the total enrollment of the whole school district. So we are not missing specific groups because POCs, um, they're more likely uh, to uh, miss school. Um, um, in my findings, I saw that um, black students, for example, are three times more likely to be suspended or miss school than um, a white student. Um, so, um, sorry, my dog. Um, so that's why um, I suggest that um, instead of daily attendance, it should be focused on the total enrollment of the school district. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Stephanie. And so our next student is Ni Pham, whose home campus is UC Riverside and who this term interned with the Office of California State Assembly Member, Philip Ting's office in the district office. Hello everyone. Okay. So my presentation is titled K through 12 education, a standard right or for the privileged. Our tax dollars fund juvenile halls, but is our money really being used beneficially? Across the US, six out of every 10 incarcerated students drop out of school, almost seven times higher than those not incarcerated. 
I wanted to find it being in a California juvenile hall affects students' education quality compared to traditional K through 12 public schools. I hypothesize that students in juvenile halls will receive a worse education quality than those in public schools. So I measured education quality by variables, including graduation and dropout rates, suspension rates, cast test achievement scores, and class accessibility rates. And I compared each indicator with the state and county rates. I additionally compared ethnicity population to see if minorities were disproportionately affected. Overall, I found a large gap between students and state and county rates on all variables, indicating that juvenile halls do have a worse education quality than public schools. As shown in figure one, incarcerated students score about 50% worse in ELA and 60% worse in math testing. As shown in figure two, chemistry and elective classes have a much lower accessibility rate than math and biology classes, possibly due to a lack of resources. Juvenile halls are also shown to have suspension rates about three times higher than public schools. In figure five, we can see minority communities are shown to be disproportionately affected, specifically Native and African Americans. However, I believe there is insufficient data to fully analyze the extent of this issue. I recommend furthering research regarding education quality and juvenile halls and increasing funding. I also recommend juvenile halls to rethink their suspension policies and punishment methods. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ni. Nee. And so if there is a question from her office, you wanna just go ahead and raise your hand. And if not, we'll go ahead and take a question from the academic team. Academic team. Great, so Professor Butters. Hey, me, uh, Professor Butters here, 196E. Great job, I think this really turned out really nicely. Uh, and I, I just wanted to know, uh, you mentioned they're related to figure two, and I think overall for your project, um, that you say that part of your relationship is possibly due to the lack of resources available in, uh, in in some of your project here. So how might you go about studying that, uh, that relationship and, and studying about the resources in um, juvenile halls rather than K through 12? So I, sorry, okay. So I definitely recommend um, looking at the resources because classes like elective classes and chemistry do require additional resources just from the nature of the courses. So I would recommend just looking in juvenile halls and I also recommend doing um, surveys from students itself themselves because I think that's also a very important aspect in analyzing this issue. But I just think that they should go into regular traditional K through 12 public schools and see what specific resources they have for these classes, like how many teachers, what supplies they have, um, such and then such as like field trips and extracurriculars that they offer, and then compare these with juvenile halls if they even offer. Fantastic. I love the survey idea as well. It's going to be tough to get that data, but that's a great idea. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so much, Ni. Nee. So our next student is Sydney Short, um, whose home campus is UC Santa Cruz and who interned this term at the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Senate Bill 379 requires cities and counties in California to amend the safety element of their general plans to address climate adaptation and resilience strategies. However, lack of funding has been determined to be a significant barrier to adaptation planning. According to a survey conducted in a report for California's fourth climate change assessment in 2018, lack of funding to prepare a plan was indicated as a hurdle by nearly 85% of respondents and a big hurdle by nearly 50%. My research further aims to study whether this is reflected in county adaptation planning in California. In my research, I aim to answer the question, how does the wealth of, county, wealth of a county affect the extent of adaptation planning? I hypothesized that counties with higher median household income will have more developed adaptation plans because they have more resources and capacity to do so. In order to test my hypothesis, I collected data for all 58 counties in California I use US census data for median household income in 2019, and I measure the extent of adaptation plans through individual research and analysis. I use a ranking system of what stage of adaptation planning the county is in from zero to five, shown in figure two. As shown in figure four, the results of my research show a correlation between county median household income and adaptation level. I suggest that future research investigate the significance of this relationship further and additional funding be provided to low-income counties for adaptation efforts. Great, thank you so much, Sydney. And so if there is a question from 
our internship host site. Um, if you can go ahead and raise your hand and I'll unmute you. All right, and if not, we will go ahead and take a question from the academic team. All right, Hannah Palmer. Great work, Sydney. Um, I have a question and looking at your map of California, can you think if there are other factors other than median household income that might play a role in a county's likelihood of, of adaptation for climate? Yeah, definitely. Great question. So I decided in my research to focus on median household income to look at that relationship, but I do um, think that there are many other factors that could play a role in the ability of counties to adapt, such as education level, the proximity to the coast, wildfire prone areas, um, whether the counties are Democratic or Republican. So those are definitely factors that could be looked into for future research that would be really important in understanding this relationship. Thank you, that's great. All right, great. Thank you so much, Sydney. And with that, I'm gonna let um, have Brooke go ahead and end the recording.